Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. The motion picture The Idol Maker is a fascinating film about teen idols in the late 1950s and 60s. And on tonight's Cinema Showcase, I'll be talking with the producer of The Idol Maker, Mr. Gene Kirkwood. I'll also be talking with one of the stars of the film, Peter Gallagher, who portrays one of the teen idols in the motion picture. Later on in tonight's program, I'll be talking with Bob Marcucci, who was the technical advisor on the film and who discovered such teen idols in the 50s as Frankie Avalon and Fabian. We'll have a scene from The Idol Maker to show you tonight. So I hope you'll stay with me as I talk with Peter Gallagher, Gene Kirkwood, and Bob Marcucci tonight on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase tonight. I'm Gene Kirkwood, Peter Gallagher, welcome to the program. Nice to be here. Let me first tell you how much I enjoy The Idol Maker, and I must say that ever since the movie American Graffiti came out and was such a big hit, I've been hoping for a film that would show us something about the other side of popular music, and at long last, I think we have it. What was the instigation for um, The Idol Maker? Well, uh, uh, knowing Bob Marcucci, uh, and also knowing the void in the recent number of films that have come out that haven't had a, a story uh, and has the, hasn't been that type of picture made. And uh, we felt we had to do something like that. Yeah. How, how difficult a property was it to bring to the screen? I know you, you filmed Rocky and had your problems with that and finally getting a distributor and all that sort of thing. How <clears> tough was the idol maker? It just took a lot of patience and development. Uh, it took about five years uh, um, to this point to get it to this point. It took about three years to get the script ready and about four years to bring it to the floor. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the screenplay. Um, and that's why the picture works. Of course, we wanted to stay away from all the cliches that mm -hmm. you've seen and, uh, and make a picture that, that wasn't an excuse to sell an album. Oh, uh, I am so tired of movies like yeah. that. Um, and, and what we're very proud of is it's not a musical, and yet there's ten songs in it. You know, that's really a story about people. Uh, so to do that, it, it took a lot of time and a lot of patience to get all the pieces together. Yeah. Peter, what interested you most about playing uh, the role you play in it? Well, just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the development of the character. You know, the emotional range and, you know, where the kids started out and where he ended up. Mm -hmm. and that whole process of becoming and, and also losing, you know. It's a and fascinating so. character. For those watching who haven't seen the movie, tell them a little bit about the character of Cesare. Well, his, his name, he lives in the Bronx with his grandmother in 19, uh, I guess it starts out in 1959. He's about 17 or 18 years old. And uh, his full name is Guido Philippe Cesare Bebilacqua, you know, an Italian from the Bible. <laughs> Don't ask me to say that, please. And uh, <laughs> the salad name after it. <laughs> and Vinnie Vicari, the idol maker, you know, in the film, discovers him bussing dishes at a restaurant and sees he has a certain kind of look and through months of grooming and, and preparation and singing and so on, you know, convinces Cesare that, you know, he, could, he can go out there and be a star. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Cesare is thinking, is this guy, is this guy for <laughs> real? I mean, what's going on? Can I trust him? And it turns out that he is a performer and, uh, and then the relationship sort of goes on the rocks as uh, Cesare feels he's lost his, his adolescence, his friends, and feeling pretty alone at the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, they break up. And so it's, it's a process of becoming a star, of, of having your life sort of, <clears throat> the life you've been accustomed to pulled out from under you and adopting a whole different set of values in a way. In preparing for this role, did you consciously study any of the... Um the teen idols of the 50s or 60s? Oh, sure. I, I listened to a lot of records. I, I watched all the tapes that I could get my hands on, to, you know, the video, I guess, whatever they were called, and the kinescopes or the videotapes. And uh, I, there wasn't anything specifically I wanted to, to steal in terms of singing style or dancing style because the music was original. You know, it yeah. wasn't, you know, the standards of, the, of that period, and it was written. It's original music by Jeff Barry. But uh, one of the, some of the interesting stuff were the interviews. Uh, I watched one interview with Fabian talking about, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's fun and all, but it's awfully lonely, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and this kind of confusion, this bewildered kid from 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 Philly, you know, not being able to step outside his hotel room. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, I thought that was important to try to communicate. Gee, what was the the toughest part of uh, 
of bringing the idol maker to the screen? Um, there wasn't one tough part. You know, it was all, because uh, the producer, everything is tough till mm -hmm. it's made well. Uh, there wasn't one really tough part. It's just getting it the way you wanted it as a whole is, is the tough part. Uh, that goes for the music, camera, lighting, uh, the, uh, the design. I wanted to make sure you had wraparound glasses and fins on caddies. <laughs> that I had to have. Uh, and, and a sense of realism uh, and honesty. Uh, you're a movie buff yourself. Yeah. I know. Um, when you're making a film, be it Rocky or Idolmaker or whatever, do you consciously try to insert into those films bits of your, your own favorite movies? No, but they, every, every picture has a, a, a something to do with everything. I mean, you, you take from things that you don't even know you're taking from because they have an influence on you. Um, um, no, but you want to keep up to the levels of the films you like. You mm -hmm. know, like Sweet Smell of Success and The Bad and the Beautiful and uh, On the Waterfront and pictures like that. Uh, you want to keep it up to that level. Peter, coming to, um, to two films really from extensive work on the stage. I know you were in Hair and in Greece. Uh, we should make a marvelous duo, I think, Hair and Greece would make it great. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. How, did you, how do you find movie making as compared to the stage? Um, it is, you know, it is different. There was a moment what, just about we were almost done shooting The Idol Maker, and I just finished shooting a scene. I was walking behind the camera. And it was the quietest, quietest sense of feeling that I'm doing exactly what I should be doing, you know, being in the right place and doing what I should be doing. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of intimacy and a different kind of power. And uh, I think if, as an actor, if, if you can balance, you know, the, the work of the, st the stage work and then the technique and the reality of an audience out there with that kind of... You know, uh, I still have so much to learn. It was marvelous doing Skag with Carl Malden because mm -hmm. he'd, he'd grab me, you know, and take me, you know, after shooting his scenes. You know, Peter, when Marlon and I were doing uh, mm. On the Waterfront, you know, we'd, oh. you know, he was talking, I was going, please, Marlon, <laughs> feed me. I want to. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, so there's still a, a, a lot yet to learn. And in that way, it's very challenging and exciting because it, uh, you know, it's, it's a whole new world. And that would, that would I imagine, be. The best training ground any young actor could have would be to either would be to work with <coughs> professionals like Carl Malden, mm -hmm. who can teach you so much simply by just by just being there, just by you watching. Him. Yeah, sure, that's incredible. We have a scene from The Idol Maker in which you are featured. Do, what do we need to know about this scene? Uh, well, I mentioned that uh, this is this is Cesare's first time out of the gate. He is, uh, you know, he after the months of preparation and publicity, advanced publicity, there are about 3,000 screaming girls at the Brooklyn Paramount waiting for this phenomenon, Cesare, that they've never seen or never seen perform. And so the first time he steps out, he sings two lines and the girls rip his shirt off and, you know, terrorize the kid. And he goes back into the dressing room and Vinnie Vicari says, leave the shirt, leave the hair, I'm sending you out there, kid, do it again. And so this is the Brooklyn Paramount. He's returning to the stage after being uh, torn, yeah. torn apart by the kids. And the right. was, it's called Baby. Before uh, we take a look at that scene, I've got to ask you to, uh, what do you plan, what are your next projects after uh, Idolmaker? Peter, what's up for you next? Well, there's nothing uh, specific. Uh, the, the, the interest uh, in me, for, there's been interest in me for several films, and uh, they've all been very different. They're not singing or dancing roles. Possibly a comedy mm -hmm. in, ja in January Great. in New York. Great. Gene, how about you? Um, we, March 1st, we start the Pope of Greenwich Village uh, with Al Pacino and Jimmy Kahn, for United yeah. Artists. Wonderful. Yeah. I want to thank the both of you for being here, Peter Gallagher and Gene Kirkwood. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you very much. It's been a pleasure. Right now, we're going to take a look at a scene from The Idol Maker, and after that, I'll be back to talk with Bob Marcucci. Hear that, Harmon? I'm not gonna let Chad out on this stage unless there's a dozen more security guards between him and the mob. You got it? Hey, I put a show on here every week. The security men out there, they have a crowd bigger than this. Now, come on, I'll do a show. show. Come on. Oh, Trust me, show. Man. What do you mean? Come on, Danny, come on. We're recording, Vinny. I hope it works. Well, how's it look out there, Jeej? So far, so good. The security guys are out there. All right. Come on, let's do a show. Okay. I'm gonna go with it. Okay. But you better be right, Norman. Good luck, kid. See you out there, Gigi. Hmm? 
Uncle Tony, let's get him out. Let's get him out. Come on, we'll do it. A scene from The Idol Maker. Join me now in welcoming to the program Bob Marcucci. Bob, thanks for being here. How are you doing? You served as technical advisor on this movie, and it doesn't take anybody, I think, with any particular insight who knows anything about you or who has read anything to note some of the similarities between the character played by uh, Ray Sharkey in the movie and yourself. How much of a, biograph, of, of a biography of you is this movie? Well, it's not totally autobiographical. It's uh, like the essence of myself. There are some scenes in there that are true, and there are some scenes that aren't even me at all. But uh, the producers wanted to do it through the eyes of the, of the idol maker. I mean, as you can see, it's all through his viewpoint, not the idols. Mm -hmm. All right, as technical advisor, what were your chief functions on this movie? Well, in the beginning of the picture, before it was put together, I got together with the writers, Edward D. Lorenzo, sat with him and gave him information. And then when they hired Taylor Hackford, I gave the same information to him. He rewrote the script along with Lorenzo and got it done. And uh, that was the beginning. After that, I was just on the set, and they would mm -hmm. ask me various things that happened in that era, certain things that I would have better knowledge of, but they had a tremendous staff of people that researched that era tremendously. You were such a, a vital part of that era. How did you get your beginning in the, uh, in the music business? I was a songwriter. I started out as a songwriter and like the picture, the similarity there is my father after 10 years came back and gave me $10,000 to start a record company and we did that. Mm -hmm. And my partner and I, P.T. Angelus, started this record company, and our first two or three records were bombs, but we didn't give up, and we finally got a hit record with a girl singer first. And then ABC Paramount Records came in and made a deal with us to distribute our label, Chancellor Records. And in turn, we started looking for idols, and as that was the thing of that, in that period, young, good-looking boys that had talent. All right, now that's... Which of those things is the key, good looking or talent? I believe that, that if you have both, it's easier. I just think in the case of the idol maker, he, uh, it didn't matter to him. Avalon had a, lot of, a tremendous amount of talent, as did, uh, well, Fabe had his own type of talent. Mm -hmm. People like Johnny Rivers I managed, they, he had a tremendous amount of talent. Lou Christie, I mean, it depends upon what the public wants at that time. How do you know what the public wants at a particular time? How do you, being in the business here, and you have to more or less keep your finger on the pulse of the public, so how do you know at any given time what, what people are well, going to want? In that period of time, it was easy. I mean, Elvis Presley was making it. Ricky Nelson was making it. Sal Mineo put out a record. He wasn't the greatest singer in the world. And the public was buying those people. But they were TV and motion picture personalities. And they weren't the artists to go out on the road to let those little kids who idolize them touch them or even get their vicarious thrill. So I thought the best thing to do was to find someone like those types of people and make them real enough for the people to touch. And that's exactly what I did with the boys I managed. 
got them out to record hops, tours, concerts, and they became as exciting and as hot as the people that were making motion pictures and TV. Mm -hmm. All right, now how much has the music business changed today? Could you do the same thing with somebody? Would it be as easy? No, I don't think it'll be as easy. I don't know whether you'd have to do it through music either. I think the music people look for someone like a manager to do it through the media of television in hopes of getting a series for 13 weeks or 26 weeks and then in turn they'll put a record out because they know that that artist is getting seen once a week. But to get airplay on records is tremendously difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not like it used to be back in 59, 60 where you walked into a radio station, gave them a record. If they liked it, it went right, right on the station. Today it's got to go through so many different boards of judges. All right, now the, the, the touchy subject of payola was, was um, hinted at in the movie. How, well, we know it was real, but to what an extent did it influence everything that went on? I think it was as influential as it was down in Washington with the senators or with anybody else who takes somebody out for lunch or buys them a gift because they help them or sends them something. I don't know if it were, was the entire reason why the music business was successful, but I do think that it was, it was there. I never was involved in that. I never had to. I think my form of payola, if you want to say it's a form of payola, was the boys doing record hops for the various disc jockeys or going back to a city after they became popular and doing something for them if they wanted it done. Mm -hmm. That would be the way that you would consider Marcucci paid off to get his records played. Yeah. Of course, that influenced, uh, I think, during that whole period, um, we had the game show scandals in television. Uh, so perhaps it, it has something to do with the, the entire era that we're talking about. Uh, I guess so. I, it, it's hard to say. It, it, I think the game show really started, and then they wanted to get to the record business and just slap it to us. But mm -hmm. they could have gone to any other business. It just seemed to be that the record business was the best one to hit. It was the, the widest media at that time that they could. And they always did it at election time, too. If you go back and look, it was always done around the election year so that the various politicians would look like they have done something for their country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Early in your, uh, in, your, in your childhood, you were, uh, I guess, not a well child. So you, you had to overcome, I know, a number of obstacles to eventually get where you did. Do you think this made you any more determined to succeed as an adult having a, a sickly childhood? Definitely. Definitely. I think that when you're an underdog, you work harder. A short person always works harder to be something than the tall person. The not so good looking person works harder to be something. It, it doesn't come as easy for you, so you've got to work harder. My life as a child was very difficult. Like you say, it was at 11 years of age, I was a cripple. So my life with, with other kids was much more difficult than the average 11-year-old. I never played sports. I never did this. So I had to find some kind of outlet. And I'm a movie buff, and I used to watch movies every week. I'd, I'd go there in a wheeling chair, and I'd watch all the 20th Century Fox MGM musicals, and mm. that became part of my life, mm -hmm. a fantasy for me. But then when I got old enough to, to think about it, I started thinking that fantasy could become a reality because it became a reality for the people that I was fantasizing with. Of the songs you've written, and you've written quite a few of them, which ones remain your favorites? Uh, I think Why is my favorite. That's the prettiest, the simplest of mm -hmm. all the ballads that we've written. There are many others that, that I like, but they never were hits that never made it. I mean, right, was, there, was, a was there one record. that became a big hit that you really have to sit back and say, now, why did that become a big hit? Dee Dee Dinah. I mean, Dee Dee Dinah was my first rock and roll record that I ever writ, wrote in my life. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand how that became a hit because <laughs> I stole the lyrics of that song or the title hit of the hits out that day. I think the, like the middle was Boney Marone and Peggy Sue. Well, they were hit songs, and I didn't know where to go. So I <laughs> said, let me take the title hit songs and put them in there. And it worked? It worked very well. It was Avalon's first big smash record, so close to a million records. Of the people you, um, 
you discovered during that period? Have you remained in close touch with them or any touch at all? If they're in my circle, I will. If, if we do things similar, I mean, Frankie Avalon plays golf, I don't. Mm -hmm. Fabian's constantly on the road doing tours or making movies. And I'm in Westwood with my two children. Mm -hmm. Really, that's my lifestyle right now. You know, we look back, I think, on that particular period of, of, of Avalon, of Fabian, of Elvis Presley as being somehow, and I think you touched on this earlier, a simpler, a simpler time. Now, was this because the music itself was simpler? Was it because the industry was simpler or? The period was. There was, the employment was high. It was better then. The inf there was no inflation. People were happier. TV wasn't the biggest thing in the world. People were listening to music more than all the TV shows. Uh, it was an age of innocence. It really was. I mean, it was a growth, but it was a, an innocent age. I mean, things weren't as open. There wasn't a tremendous drug scene. And if it was, it was very hidden, mm -hmm. not as open as it is today. So in that respect, do you think the, do you think the industry, do you think it's a, a more enlightened period now? Do you think the music is any better? Oh, I think the music is tremendously better. I mean, the album that we're putting out, the music and the album is absolutely sensational. It, it touches of the 60s, and yet it's a, a track that the people could love in the 80s. I think the young people today are going back to find something of the 60s because they haven't got what they want now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that Jeff Barry did that for them. This picture, even though it, we, we did it in May, the music was done a year ago. So he's going back to the 60s and giving the kids something today that they can have. And they're, they're not going to have to go back to the oldies but goodies because they're going to have it in this, in this, in this mm -hmm. movie. Well, as Gene Kirkwood said earlier, it's, um, it's a movie that has 10 songs in it, but it really isn't a musical. No, it's not a musical. It's a picture about people, mostly about one man and what he did to make two young kids off the street into big superstars. Mm -hmm. We, uh, of course, talking with Peter Gallagher, I think we should mention uh, also in the film is a very fine actor, Ray Sharkey, who portrays he is basically you. sensational. He should definitely be nominated for the Academy Award. What were your thoughts when you watched him, in essence, portraying you? Let's just say that if I'm watching something that I didn't like, of not him, of me, it hurt. But it sure did a lot of good for me. I mean, it has just made me realize a lot I mean, it's like analysis, really. I mean, two hours of complete analysis, but to me it was every day. So what I didn't like wasn't Ray Sharkey, wasn't the picture, wasn't the scene. I didn't like what I did then, because I'm not that same person today. Mm -hmm. What in particular? Well, one scene in particular is when they're upstairs on the balcony and Brenda tells Vinnie Vicari that uh, he uses people to get ahead, that he pushes them around. I never knew that I used people, and if I did, I didn't do it with any malice or any malicious intent. Uh, if I knew that with my upbringing and my guilt, I never would have made them into stars because I would have felt too guilty to do it. But when I look at it today, I say, I guess I did use them. But it's not bad. I mean, it's not bad to use people. I mean, we all use each other. I mean, women use men, men use women. It's, it's an everyday thing. But back in, in that day, if I thought I was using somebody to make my own self better, that would bother me. So it bothered me when I, when I saw that scene. I said, it's not true, that didn't happen. But that really did happen, I guess. I guess mm -hmm. I did do that. So those things hurt. Yeah. You were writing a book, as I understand now, about idols all through the years. What, what will this book contain? I guess it will contain a lot of personal reminiscences, too. Won't Definitely. It? I'll have more of my personal life when I was, th from three, three years of age on. It'll have some of the things of the picture, but it'll elaborate more on, on the, the biography of Bob Marcucci, but it still won't have my name in it. I think it's more interesting to write a, a book when you could put uh, different names and, and do like Jacqueline Suzanne used to do, but not as, as R-rated <laughs> as that, though. Um, being as closely in the, mu in the, music, uh, closely, uh, in the music industry as you've been, what do you think have been the major influences in the past 30 years. Of course, we have Elvis Presley, but who since Elvis? <clears throat> oh, got the Beatles for sure. Definitely the Beatles. People like Chicago, uh, the Creedence Clearwater type mm -hmm. artist, Elton John. Now we have Billy Joel. There are a tremendous amount of artists that will always come out and touch, but 
whatever they touch, they're going to take a little bit of the past and touch us with their rendition of it. Like Hole and Oates just came out with a record called Lost at Love and Feel, and it was done by the Righteous Brothers. But they're giving it the Hole and Oates sound. And Diana Ross now is doing the, the old Motown sound that she did mm -hmm. back in the 60s. And Stephanie Mills is doing Diana Ross doing the old Motown sound. So we're really going back to the 60s. And that's why if anybody wants that period and wants that sound and wants to, to relive it, then the idol maker is the place to go mm -hmm. Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night during the week. Any, also. any night of the week. Any <laughs> night of the week, right. What about you personally? What, uh, are there any future Frankie Avalons or Fabians on the horizon for you? There'll always be something like that, Mommy. I mean, once you're a manager, you're always a manager. I, I don't know if it'll be Frankie Avalon or Fabians, but if I could find someone that has a triple threat talent that a Peter Gallagher has, a good actor, a good singer. I mean, he has all, all that going for him. There's nothing that you have to really work with to make it happen. Yes, I would get involved. It would be less work for me than I, because I think I could really manage somebody by phone now, mm -hmm. whereas I didn't, wasn't able to do it then. Yes, someone like a Peter Gallagher with that kind of a talent, uh, sure, I'd, I'd manage in a minute. Yeah. Bob, I want to thank you very much for being here. It's been a pleasure for me, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I have sure have. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. My thanks to Gene Kirkwood, to Peter Gallagher, to Bob Marcucci. My thanks to you for watching. Until next time, good night.